one of the things about a role like this, that mm. it is such a sort of tour de force, that I wondered if she had been your person. You know, because she's one of those people that many um, women in particular have read all of their lives and mm. think, you know, she, she's mm. the person. Um, so you came to her... Fresh. Fresh. So you were just going to inhabit I wanted the role to. on the page. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think, that, uh, and, and maybe there's, there's no footage of her walking, talking. I, I haven't seen anything. And I've asked and asked and the assistant director, John, who's sitting here, also went through the BBC and they have no knowledge of it. That it's been very difficult to try and get some sort of impression of her. Just there's photographs and that's it. So one has to kind of just sort of assimilate really from the research that one does and try and do one, the best ones can to, to, like every character, you try to do the best you can, whether it's famous or not. You try to get mm. into the, just the essence of them rather than, because you can never be them, you can, otherwise it becomes a, you become like Rory Bremner, you know, you, you, you make a, what's the word? An impersonation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you become a mimic. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to get her, her because there's so much sadness and, and toughness that also that she was, could be vicious as well. So, so there's all that going on in there. Uh, I just think, I have to say that Hugh has, there's uh, probably 99% of what is in the play is Hugh Whitemore has stitched all this together. Mm. And so that the poems come out of, they come out of a, um, a scene that he's written, but with all her, with all her writing in it. Mm -hmm. And you'll suddenly read, uh, you know, I go through novel on yellow paper and there's a whole stack of stuff that, mm -hmm. that uh, Hugh's knitted into it beautifully. And of course, I mean, everybody here will know Hugh Whitemore, who, mm. you know, sort of last cigarette and obviously mm. um, uh, wonderful, marvellous year for plums. Indeed. Yes. Is it wonderful or marvellous year for plums? Oh. Audience <laughs> knows. Marvellous, thank you. The audience here knows. Um, but one of the things that's so joyous to, to listen to you and to watch it is exactly that, that the poetry doesn't feel like, oh, here is the set piece. Mm. Sometimes you almost, the way you do it, you don't quite realise it's a poem until five or six lines mm. in. Mm. And that is an extraordinary thing to see on the stage, mm. poetry being part of the narrative. Mm. So did you rehearse all the scenes as they were, or did you actually separate out the poems and no. read them all and then just put those... those no, they were all, all it's because it's part of the whole thing, you can't just take them out. And I find, I do find, I, I'm, I get very self-conscious when I hear people reading poetry because there is that kind of thing about it. That it becomes very serious and then, you know, it, and it's terribly worthy. They declaim. Yes, it, it is. And so I have a slight um, uh, embarrassment because I don't feel I'm very good at it. But with Stevie, I feel because it comes out of these situations, this, and Hughes picked things which are very, very emotional, and, but they're apt. Uh, some of her poetry is very impenetrable and difficult. Mm. Her religious stuff is really hard. I, I have a difficulty doing poetry, uh, so, so Stevie's right up my street. Because, <laughs> because actually her, her poems are like chatting yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that was... Um, so marked when I was watching you do it. Although you said that there's no archive footage of her walking and mm, talking, mm, being mm, a person, mm. there are photographs, and that very angular picture that most people know with the, <laughs> the hair. terrible hairdo. Uh, the ha <laughs> terrible. Well, it was a jolly good wig, I must say. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, But you do look extraordinarily like her in good. those pictures. But you've made a decision to have your voice, not hers, because there are some archive recordings, and they're awfully clipped. Aren't they? But then she says out. Yeah. So Which did you I, do decide not to copy that in no, any way? It would drive people nuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it wasn't dated. the best. It, yeah, it's too dated. You have to do it. You just have to. It, it's a fine line. I mean, I've rehearsed it very, very far back, and then it started to. Then I, then I got. Then I forgot it. <laughs> and then and then uh, it, it's sort of on the middle ground now because she was lived in Palmer's Green and, and so not, but what Chris does brilliantly is a very suburban accent, Chris Larkin, which is mm. brilliant, which I think maybe I, I could have gone in that direction, mm. but I decided not to. I tried to just, just slide in between each one so that it wasn't, you couldn't, you couldn't pocket her away into a, a, a caricature. 
and, and that's why I kind of didn't lay it on too much. I was, we've been, I, I was rehearsing with it very strong and then I decided to drop it and then I, then it, so we've tried every which way um, to do it and this is the only, this is what I've came up, come up with. Is, is that quite, um, is that a usual uh, process for an actor that you go in with a certain sort of sense of how you want to play it and then it breathes and it comes in and out mm. when you're working with obviously Chris and Linda Barron as well. Mm -hmm. is, 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 is that what you aim for as an actor to unpick it? Unpick it, uh, delve into it, research it, um, uh, just tr try things out, fail. Um, um, also with this piece particularly, with this piece, uh, the, it's very difficult. It's 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 a hybrid of its own, mm. so it uh, it's got all the. So who Chris is, the man, who the man is, who changes. It's difficult for an audience to assimilate. That's what we discovered. Um, they didn't. An audience thinks, what's going on? There's a man talking to us, and then Stevie comes on and talks to us. But the aunt never talks to to you. So it's kind of. Uh, an audience finds it quite hard initially to find out what's going on, so we had to really research, not research, but work on how we can make it easier. Mm. Um, we had sometimes a little bit of music when I said, this is my aunt. That's the first time that Stevie talks to the audience and they're not quite sure what's going on. Mm. So we had some music underneath that, and then we decided not to have the music and then we'd have the lighting change. So it's an experiment and so you're working. And this happens with every play. Um, there is a. 90% of the time, and there's somebody who's really got a very, very strong idea. You, you have to experiment, you have to find things out, especially if it's the first time you've done it. I mean, most actors have never done things before, or directors even. So it's, 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 it's a journey of discovery, as you probably all have witnessed in this theatre. But yeah. I was um, amazed when I was reading the programme to mm. realise that Hugh had written this in 1977, mm -hmm. because it feels incredibly modern and very fresh. That's great. I thought. Did, mm. You know, w when you got the script, did you not feel that as well? That it was, or did it feel more of a period piece for you? It didn't feel period. I just felt it was an... I felt it was, I just thought, <coughs> how can you hold an audience for that length of time about just in the front room? <laughs> Um, well, you know what, you employ happens. Zoe Wanamaker, that's how you do it. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Glenda Jackson did it and it was a huge hit and it went into the West End and it ran in the West End. Um, mm. I don't think, I'm not sure that a West End audience now would do that. So it, it's quite interesting to see if that would hold, because I don't think in West End, they want, I don't know what they want, but it's not this little funny person. You know. um, so it's wonderful for me that it allows Stevie Smith to suddenly come out of her grave again. <clears throat> so what is it when you get a script, mm. something like this, so that it's not that there was a love affair in the first place, mm. so what is it that makes you say, yes, I'm going to do this play now, Ooh. because you could do anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> ha, -ha. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's just sort of something to do with you've never something I've never done before. Mm. If it's something that's challenging or, or interesting and has a kind of a smell about it uh, that makes it think, oh, I'm I've never done that. Let me try that. Mm. So that's really what it is. And, and then you think, why did they ask me to do this? <laughs> and then you have to think, why? Uh, it's, it's all that sort of thing. Mm. And when I, you know, certainly you sing it again this evening. The first time I was just in awe of the number of words yeah. <laughs> that you say. Because although, of course, it's a three-hander, at the same time, it is a punctuated monologue, yeah. in a way, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so that, presumably, when you first get the script, you think, oh, blimey. <laughs> do you feel blimey, or do you think, well, hey, Terrified, terrified. Terrified, <laughs> terrified. Um, yes, especially if, I, if you're slow of learning. Um, Are you slow? I'm learning? very slow. Um, I think it's because of dyslexia. Uh, sometimes if things aren't written well, that makes it harder to learn. Because there's no proper yeah, cadence because to it. Yeah, and you mm. think with, with uh, some scripts that you get, um, film scripts or television scripts, that sometimes the writing is really sparse and not particularly interesting. Mm. So those are the most difficult things to do. But this um, wasn't that difficult. It's just that the volume of it, yeah. I think. Um, and because she liked to chat, you know, so, it, and then it's discovering 
and also because she laughed a lot. I mean, you can hear there's a recording that Hugh, in his preface to, to the, the publication of uh, Stevie, write, wrote a little thing about he heard a recording of Stevie talking, and then she starts telling this story, and, she's, and then she's laughing. Mm. She says a sentence, and then she laughs and breaks it off laughing, and then that gave me a, a fantastic clue. Um, uh, so, so it, it was the it was the complexity of character. I think that's what makes me interested. It's the complexities. And when, when you're sitting on a stage, um, you know this is pretty much almost everybody's stage. <laughs> um, mm. But you look out at all of these people. When you have that volume of characterization and words and the story to tell and the responsibility, you know you're the linchpin of mm -hmm. the show as well. Uh, do you feel that you have any freedom? Um, in terms of how you say things or how the lines come? Or yes. is it like a piece of music that one note must follow the rest in order uh, for you to keep going? I think this is in every play. The, the braver you become and the more solid you become with your character and with who you are and the play and the lines and, the, um, and what you... Uh, then you have a focus. Um, and, then, and then, for instance, tonight was... Uh, you were Beautiful House, which gives you great freedom. And so that you you can relax as an actor because you think oh oh they I can hear them they they yeah. they're enjoying it they're listening. Um, last night we had a really really boring house. <laughs> if any of you were in yeah. last night, just <laughs> pretend you were there. <laughs> and I mean there was a man asleep within <laughs> ten minutes. It wasn't you, sir. It, it, was it? No, good. Within okay. the first ten minutes he was asleep. I know it's warm in here, but you know hey, um, <laughs> you just thought, oh. Um, but it is about, it's all also about the more embedded that you, that, that I call it in, in a, as an actor, when you feel you can, what I call hovercrafting, which means you just suddenly, you, it's a bit zen, and it's you become the target, the target becomes you, you are the character, and, and suddenly it all works, and it's, it's like, it's like the most wonderful thing in the world. Um, it's like gliding, it's like just <laughs> heaven when you can actually let go of yourself and mm. let the character mm. come through. Um, and that's what every actor, I think, strives for. Mm. And so sometimes you feel like one of those swans trying to get up off the, off the you know, the paddle and they're flapping like that and they're trying to get, trying to get up and away, uh, but they can't get up. And sometimes I felt, I felt like that swan, <laughs> can't get up. Um, but it, that's what one hopes mm. for. So, so all the preparation and all the work that one does that you can actually let go and inhabit. That's what you look for. And actually, it felt, I mean, it did feel, having seen it on Friday and mm. tonight, mm. it did feel a different house tonight. Yes, yeah, very there much. Was a, there was a sort of sense of breath and open space and And you're engagement. all very intelligent. Yes. <laughs> Whereas obviously the critics... On Friday night, they laughed at all the old comments about critics, I noticed. Yeah, they the press room. They thought that was hilarious. They're so <laughs> egocentric. <laughs> but what, what, one of the things that I really noticed, um, you know, tonight, uh, you know, because, as I said, the first time I was just going, blimey, um, was that there were so many other things underlaying it. So not just her and what you were doing and your characterisation of her, but actually really subtle, clever things about what it means to be a writer, ah. for example. Yes. <laughs> like, ah. Um, yes. But, I mean, extraordinarily subtle, uh, in a way that you wouldn't actually expect to hear on a stage, mm. and it makes sense. But the way that you delivered all of those lines about what it felt like mm. to write, mm. um, and that made me think, did you write? Do no. you write a bit? No. Because no, no. you... you you seem to also get right under the skin of that. Well, I understand writers. I mean, I, I mean, I live with somebody who writes, so uh, it is. And I've tried p pathetically to write something. When somebody's asked me to write something, it's always been disastrous. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, um, and I just am full of admiration. I mean, one of the reasons I went into the theatre was to do new writing, ironically enough, and. Uh, because at that time it was very, very important. I and mean, writers are the most important thing. That's what our tools as actors we have, and thank God for them. And it's, um, and also it's just the, the use of the English language, which is so wonderful. I mean, anybody can write, it's just a 
genius. <laughs> right. Good. That's all I wanted. We're yeah, yeah. off now. Yes. <laughs> exactly. um, well, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Mm. Um, if anybody has anything, if you're um, ready for it. Gentlemen up the top. Thank you. Um, you say tomorrow Zoe has two performances. How do you cope with the different audiences in the two performances? Because you've obviously talked about having a, a, at least a night's sleep or something between yesterday's <laughs> audience and tonight's audience. Uh, but is it difficult on the day to have to cope with two It's just like the snooker, really, isn't it? Good <laughs> night's sleep. Did everybody hear that? It's the difference between two different audiences tomorrow. Um, no, you just take, you, you know, you, you have to sort of, they have to get used to you and you have to get used to them. So you have to listen. You, your other ear is going. So you have to be conscious of this. Um, I feel that when, as an actor, you can rehearse in a rehearsal room, and then when you put it in front of an audience, you're now working with a third person who you've never worked with before. So, it, it, so every night there's a different energy that comes b back at you. So you're listening for that as well. So uh, your ear is attuned to, to every different... It's not difficult. What you're constantly trying to do is present your the play in the best way that you can so that everybody can enjoy it. And if, for instance, like a different house like tonight, then there's a then you can just kind of float on, on the appreciation of the intelligence that's going around the room. And then yesterday, it's a different audience where they don't, you, you don't hear their responses. You don't hear, you can't feel that, that they're with you. So you have to kind of work with them. Also, you have to keep that thing of, of the person, the character keeping going. And if, if they don't get it, then they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, does, it does it provoke you? When, when you've got a soggy audience, do you want to sort of... Does it make you sort of up it a bit angry. in order to poke them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can't be angry. You just have to do... You know, you have to... The, the play is the most important thing. The character is the most important thing. So you can't get um, upset that maybe they aren't getting it, but as far as you're concerned. So it could be a selfish thing. Maybe I don't think that, but maybe they are. They just happen to be different. Mm. So, you know, you can't judge mm. them like that. Mm. Um, Another question. Yeah. Lady there and then the lady. You brought out so well all the different aspects of the woman. Um, and it, it came to me in the first half that she was so wonderfully confident in herself that she dared not to marry in a time when you really did have to marry in you know, <coughs> standing in whatever society you were mm. in. And yet later on in the second half, her lovely gay friends talks about how she's nervous and we you know, we, of course we get this all the way through, the way you sit, the way your legs are apart, that's so brilliant. <laughs> but, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> she got it, she got it. <laughs> the tights. <laughs> the tights. <laughs> Fabulous. Absolutely. I know. Absolutely right on. But it must have been quite difficult to work out as an actor um, how, you get, how you portray this woman who is on one side, does have that self-confidence, and on the other side is... Deeply miserable. Mm. It's very, very yeah. lonely. Very lonely person. I mean, the fact that she was always going off weekending and using other people as their, her family, you know, it's a very interesting situation. And always coming back to the aunt. Always coming back to suburbia. Always. And, and I don't think she liked sex. I don't think, I don't think she enjoyed it. <clears throat> I don't think it was something... I, don't, I think she had a a lesbian relationship um, a couple of times, but she was, you know, pretty... And she was her tuberculosis glands. I mean, she was very, very tired all the time. Uh, she doesn't just say that. It, it, it was... She did go to sleep a lot, had to go to rest and stuff. Uh, she was a tiny person, um, and all that stuff... Uh, and she also could be really vicious. Um, from the biographies I've been reading, you know, she could be really nasty. And, uh, and I can't remember exactly who it was. I've been, I, I mean, I, I keep the biography with me all the time, so I'm reading it all the time, so I pick it up and pick it. Um, it's a very complex human being. The ego was extraordinary. 
Um, she worked really hard to try and get her, her poems published, her books. I mean, she she was she was pretty insistent. Um, so there is that kind of thing. There's the, the ego uh, uh, and the arrogance and the brain, because she certainly had a brain. Um, and yet there was this... It's, it's just a very... It's a fascinating character, complex, and relationships. And when, what she says, it's like a clutch at the hen coop in the mid-Atlantic. What an extraordinary thing mm. to say. Mm. I mean, it's just... Yeah. So I think she really was, is honest about it. But you keep her. I think your, your point is absolutely right, that you give all of that so it's clear, but you, mm. you never let her become nasty in your characterization. You keep her just this side of the line. Mm. You, you got to, otherwise an yeah. audience goes, oh, I'm sorry, I don't like you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, I mean, I have to be careful yeah. with it. Yes. But it's also that moment when that, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking when she says, but I loved my aunt. Oh. I mean, that is just a wonderful moment. Mm. Question there. You've talked about uh, hovercrafting of the audience. Yes. It's very easy here because it's almost wraparounds. <laughs> uh, how difficult is it if you're in a more sort of proceeding? Like language? in the Olivier, yeah. at the National. And, and if, it tra if it should transfer, how much say does the company have in what sort Where of... it goes? Yes. Every say, I would think. Um, if it ever, you know. Um, uh, but, uh, you, you know, hovercrafting is just something that, if it happens to me, in, with whatever pearl I'm playing, I'm happy if I can get there. Um, this theatre, I think, is wonderful. I mean, when, I, when we did a lecture here, it was the best time ever. Um, I love this theatre, I love this space. I think it's fabulous. There's something about having people very close. It's also, um, I just find it, you can, you, know, you can do great, you can do fantastic stuff here. Um, because oh, I, something about the language makes it, because the language is much more, you, you have to use the language much more, not much more, that's, that's, that's not a good thing to say. I, I think it's, I beg your pardon? No, not conversational necessarily, because a lecture was not certainly not conversational. <laughs> um, Depends um, on the sort of friends you've got, I no, imagine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but, it, it, but I think because it's so concentrated in this space, then you listen. The words are much more powerful. Mm. I think that's mm. what I mean. Mm. Um, uh, so that's why I love it. Uh, and also you can do detail. No, in every, in every performance that, that one tries to do, one always tries to inhabit the character wherever you are, whether it's in a space this big or in the Olivier, which mm. is, you know, a big space and requires a lot of um, energy and because you have to speak from the back of your head almost. But um, in fact, I mean, I, I think the quality of the writing and the quality of your performance and indeed Chris and Linda, mm. if you were in a different space, it would be a different sure. production, but I think it would speak just as well. Actually, I think so too. You know, I, I, really I, th I, th I think it's a really good play. Well, thank you. Well, no, I, think, no, I mean, I, I, you know, because it, it, sometimes it's, it's sometimes very hard to say something quite as categoric as that, mm. but actually it works. Oh, Hugh it would works. be thrilled. Well, would I told him. I told him. Good, good. Um, <laughs> we have one or two more questions. Can I just ask you, the integral part, was, it, was she supposed to have heart? Or did, was that improvised by the Hugh Whitmore? No, she was close yeah. to her aunt. Yes, because she was actually like a rock. Like, That's right. Her, mm. that was her. Yes. And of course, the scathiness of not actually appreciating her, her writing. Yes. Her, yes. She sat with that. Mm. Yes. It sounded grounded. One felt grounded. Yes. Her, but later. Yes. But, but yeah, that came across very well. I think the two of you together. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, there's a wonderful relationship. It's, it's also when you read the, the biography, you know that you know they were came from Hull, and her mother painted, her, Madge, <laughs> her auntie painted, uh, so they, they were very well read. Uh, Madge went to was always at a church and used to do the, the cassocks for the boys, for the, the choir boys and stuff. So, you know, there was a community. It was very much, I mean, we're talking about two world wars that, 
that, mm. that and it's a different era. And when Hughes did that wonderful speech, which is about the sunny time, a happy childhood, you know, this, you know, when people brought their marrows to the Harvest Festival, believing in peace, but you know, there was that kind of this England kind of fantasy about it, and. Uh, it it's just goes through that extraordinary time before the First World War, then it goes into the Second World War, and things changed quite dramatically. I mean, the fact that she was a, a woman trying to get published is another thing. Um, we go into all that. I mean, then you've got people like Edith Sitwell, who must have influenced her into some way. You know, that's kind of... Mm. You hear her singing. I mean, do take Muriel out is the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> should yeah. it. It's hysterically funny. Um, and this performance stuff that she used to do. So um, she, I think she was off the wall, along mm -hmm. with uh, Allen Ginsberg and people like that. Do you, do you think you would like her? Because you're, you're so intimate with her as the <laughs> character. Or is that just I not would be, relevant? I think she would frighten me. Yeah. I think she'd frighten me because, firstly, she's... In That's because you've got her hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because she was highly, highly well-read. And uh, I would feel slightly... I, and I did say this to the director at one point. I think I'm slightly intimidated by her. That's interesting. Mm. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Was she cruel? Was she cruel? I think, I think intellectually, she probably, I know that there was, um, John, help me, can you remember who she had a big fight? Was it Oliver Manning? Olivia Manning? No. It was somebody right. else. Uh, she had a big... Uh, well, she squabbled, didn't she, intellectually, she, with other yes, writers in, yes, in that yes, area? Yes, she did. Yeah. Um, and there's, in a, there's another biography that I've got that I've got to give back to the library, but, um, <laughs> which they had to fish out, I think, because nobody's, nobody knows her Stevie anymore. Um, but there was a, there's a whole thing where she was nearly libelous when she was rude about somebody. Um, so, yes, she's... Uh, well, she had a big thing with George Orwell, you were saying. Well, I don't, we don't know whether she had an affair with George Orwell, but, I mean, she, but she did have a... Yeah. They found him, and he was known. Yes, yes. I mean, we're, we're living in extraordinary times. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, there wasn't any expectation in those days that people made a living out of being writers. Yes. So, you know, it was a only small... Only men. Only men, <laughs> and not many of them either. There was one question up there, and then I need to let Zoe go home. <laughs> yes. Going back to the complexity of her character, I was curious about the attempted suicide. That wasn't really ex uh, explored no. in the play, was it? No. Was it in the biography? Or, you know, what was your it, feeling it, yes. about that? Yes. Why did she do it? Well, well it's, it's not, not very well recorded. That's the problem. Uh, there's one story that she, it Nunes, at the publishers, uh, her boss, uh, came into her room and she had an orm ornament of, I can't remember what animal it was, but it was an animal, and that he touched the animal and she went for him with a pair of scissors. And then she went for herself. And that's when she says, I've retired now, of course, I've retired early, because she was then said, I think you should go. <laughs> they said, I think it's time you went. <laughs> yeah. um, and she tried to slash her wrists, I think. Um, but it's not recorded. Nobody actually has, has written down what happened, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, but, and also what she thought about death. I mean, there is some interesting things about what she thought about, um, uh, about suicide as well. I don't think actually she had the guts. But, you know, she did believe in it, uh, voluntary euthanasia, which I think is marvellous. But she did have this extraordinary thing about death and a joyous thing, as she says, as she says herself. I, I find her riveting. <laughs> and, it, and it's one of those extraordinary things that, in a way, for, for a biographer and for this as a bi biographical play, mm. it's interesting, mm. but it makes not a jot of difference to the quality of her poetry. No. You know, because the art is not the life, mm. actually, mm. however much it comes mm. out of it. But ladies and gentlemen, the astonishing Zoe Wanamaker. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you, Kate. <laughs>